Take us back to your life, your early life in Germany, so that we can understand how your views were shaped. What, what happened to you and your family during the Second my World War? My mother was Jewish. My father came from a long German family. I was the only child. Had wonderful parents in a wonderful atmosphere of the pre-Hitler Berlin. My parents, particularly my mother, were intensely aware of what was coming up in terms of the assaults on human rights and social justice. My father, having been a very distinguished man, didn't consider it possible that something would happen to his family. So he got stuck, and it was very, very difficult. Um, Both my parents and I were in different camps, but survived partly by luck, partly by the kindness of people. And it was a post-war Germany that taught me how mindful one has to be of the roots of democracy and also that I needed to be in a country that with a democracy that was less mortgaged than the German because of my pacifism, because of having survived war in Berlin and having known totally intellectually and viscerally that violence is pointless, leading more to more violence and more hatred. I wanted the involvement in the citizenship of another country that had firmer groundings. You're telling me that all that you learned from the the traumas that you faced when you came to this country, this was not solely about your personal space and what you might want to learn. You came to this country to speak out. I did, and mostly to act out, both teach and tell. Well, that goes back to the issue of the responsibility of the citizen. It does, except that the citizen has, in fact, paid people to do something. We do have developed a structure of sharing work and sharing a responsibility. And it is a strengthening and not a shortcutting of the institutions that we have that concerns me at the moment profoundly because our basic parliamentary representative democracy is so curtailed by a variety of shortcuts and factors that I see that with great fear because the not working, at times one thinks intentionally choreography to not work is the invitation to fascism, is a dream of the strong guy who cuts through all this nonsense and gets things done. And that's where it links to my past unrest, inequality, inflation, lack of, of loans in Germany that produced a situation that cried out for the strong, decisive male. And I see this far closer to the Canadian reality than many of my friends. Don't you think we have enough checks and balances in our democratic system here? We have them. We don't use them. We have them. And one of the big ones is the opposition both parliamentary and extra-parliamentary. I mean, I was horrified to hear the prime minister say that members of the opposition couldn't be trusted. If people elect a representative and they happen to be from a party that is not the prime minister's party, that does not mean they are not trustworthy. And to to say, as a prime minister of Canada, to say or imply that members 
of the opposition by virtue of being in opposition are less trustworthy. I, I just find that that leaves me speechless. And a lot of this debate, as it yeah. were, is happening um, against a backdrop of increasing political apathy. There are a lot of people who will say the public doesn't care. The public doesn't care about these issues. They don't affect the public. Oh, do you agree with that, first of all? No. And, and do you see apathy out there? And does it yeah, I see apathy out there. But I also see reasons for apathy out there. And that is the non-response of governments. The cure for that apathy of young people is a bit of response. Any teacher knows if you want any engagement of your students, you have to involve them. The kind of um, personal mission that you have, you challenge orthodoxy, you battle established ways of thinking. Do you see that happening in the generations who you still teach, or do you see uh, more obedience? What, what are you seeing? The kid, there's nothing wrong with the kids. But the example that we set them, where I thought it is doable, you see, I went into this with a firm belief that one could actually do something with the Canadian government. But the idea that as citizens, our instrument is a policy of our government, has been so discredited by the inaction of the government that the young say we aren't stupid. Why should we work with you guys? You haven't cared the word for us. How do you do how do you define peace? I define peace not as the absence of war, but as the presence of justice and the absence of fear. There's peace when people don't have to be afraid, and people don't have to be afraid when there's genuine justice. Period. Peace is indivisible. The justice has to hold for. And that, that's it. And I think uh, they're just, they're just one of those things for which there isn't an opting out clause. You cannot have peace without justice, and you cannot have justice without peace. And it seems to be so, so difficult although it's so, so obvious. Do you think um, many people who actually agree to go to war understand what you just said? The people who make decisions who go to war has what I consider evil intent. They have no feeling either of alternatives or of responsibility to what happened, not only to those whom they send, but to everybody but they would argue with you that they are going, for example, Afghanistan, they are going in order to uphold the very democracy that you say is threatened. Well, good luck. The tool is totally unsuitable to the task, period. What kind of society do you dream about for future generations? The dream of a peaceful society to me is still the dream of the potluck supper, the a society in which all can contribute and all can find friendship, that those who bring things, bring things that they do well, but that we create conditions under which a potluck is possible. Ursula Franklin, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Thank you for having me and listening.